Hey, what's up? It's Larry, and this is a Sunday morning message on YouTube. Thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going to have some fun with this message. One of my favorite topics in the Bible to talk about is revelations, because there's so many different uh, theories out there, and there's so much theology out there, and a lot of people don't agree with revelations. Uh, but it is a lot of fun to talk about, and one of the biggest questions in Revelation is found in Revelations 11. And it's, who are the two witnesses? But before I get into that, I would just like to say, this week, a guy I know, I didn't know him very well, but a guy I had worked with in the past, named Mike Scarlett, was found shot to death with his wife in their house. Uh, Mike, I worked with him on a movie called The University of Las Colinas. I ran into him a few times in Cleburne, Texas. Um... Super, super nice man. One of the nicest people I ever met. Uh, it's sad what happened to him. And you know, we uh, when something bad happens like this, we're often asking ourselves why, why, why such a good person. And his wife was apparently a very good person as well. Everything I've seen said about them, they were such great people. Why do bad things happen to good people? And that comes... The answer comes because we live in a fallen world and we have free will, which is a bad and a good thing. It's a great thing because some of us choose that free will and we choose to love God, worship God and serve God with it. On the same token, some of us choose not to do that and we go a different direction and we go towards the evil and towards the bad and we get corrupted and we do horrible things like what happened to Mike and his wife. So, very sad news coming from Dallas about Mike and his wife this week. And I just want to say to Mike's family and all of his really close friends, you know, he was such a great guy. I enjoyed working with him and my thoughts and prayers. I know that's a cliche now. But uh, my prayers are with you guys. And uh, my heart hurts. And I'm just going to pray that God's there with you through your grieving process. So with that said, now it's, uh, it's it's hard to transition, right? It's hard to go from talking about something sad into something that I want to be fun and something something that I enjoy talking about a lot, which is theology. And it's important to note that with theology, you're not going to agree. And you may not agree with everything I say today in this message. And you may think I'm crazy and I'm way off base. And that's fine. I would love to hear your theories. I'd love to see what you think and hear and respectfully discuss the way you believe and why you believe. So what I'm going to attempt to do in this video, in this message, is I'm going to attempt to identify the two witnesses in Revelations 11 and uh, just use scripture to identify these guys. So there's a couple of guys it could be, there's a couple of suspects for the longest, longest, longest time. I thought Enoch from Genesis 5, Enoch was one of these two witnesses because Enoch never died, right? Enoch walked faithfully with God, and there was no more because God took him away. He didn't die. He walked faithfully with God, and God was no more. He just disappeared, and God took him away. So, for a long, long time, I thought Enoch might be one of these two witnesses in Revelation 11. But outside of him not dying, I cannot find any scripture to support Enoch was one of these two witnesses. Um, so, I'm going to throw that out. I mean... Is it out of the realm of possibility? No. Uh, will I be here to find out? No, because I believe in the rapture, and I hope I hope I'm lucky enough to be taken up in the rapture before all this happens. So let's talk a little bit about these two witnesses um, and why I don't think Enoch's going to be one of them. So first, these two witnesses show up halfway through the tribulation. So there are two points. The tribulation is the last seven years before. Jesus Christ comes back. And to put it frankly, all hell is going to break loose on earth. All kinds of stuff. This is where we're going to see the rise of the Antichrist. Uh, we're going to see a lot of evil, a lot of death, a lot of destruction. But if you believe like I believe, and again, it's okay, you don't have to. I respect your opinion. But I believe in a pre-trib rapture. I believe that the church will not be here. I believe I can support that in scripture too, but I won't get that get to that right now. But I believe the church won't be here when all this stuff occurs. So the body of God will be gone 
and then the tribulation, the worst seven years this world has ever seen, is going to start. Halfway through the tribulation, these two guys are going to show up, known as the two witnesses from Revelations 11. Let's read that real quick. Revelations 11, 3. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, cloth and sackcloth. They are the two olive trees, the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouth and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. And they have the power to turn the waters into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Now, Revelations 11 doesn't spell out who these two guys are, but I do think it gives us a lot of clues in, to who they are. And a lot of times in Revelations, we have to look other places in the Bible to get answers that Revelations doesn't tell us, right? We have to do our own detective work. And so that's what we're about to do. So let's break down uh, Revelations 11. The first thing we know, two witnesses. Two witnesses, right? And they prophesied for 1260 days, which is roughly three and a half years. Um, and then it tells us they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. Olive trees, lampstands, two. What does that mean? Well, let's dissect that first. All right, let's talk about Zechariah. Let's look to Zechariah 4. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. He asked me, what do you see? I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. I asked the angel, who talked with me? What are these, my Lord? He answered, do you not know what are these? No, my Lord, I replied. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zebrel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So the olive trees are two prophets, right? The olive trees are two prophets. We can detect that right here. This is the word of the Lord to Zebarel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. So these olive trees speak for the Lord. So we look at Zechariah, see the olive trees speaking for the Lord. Then we look at Revelation 11, which calls these two witnesses olive trees. So, all right, we know they're going to be prophets. We got two prophets. We're trying to figure out who these two prophets in Revelation 11 are. Prophets. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. Where have we seen that before? Have we seen, let's ask ourselves, have we seen a prophet call down fire from heaven and destroy people that want to harm him before? I'm going to say, yes, we have. And where have we seen this? Let's flip to 2 Kings chapter 1. So we're going back to the Old Testament. Kings 1.10 Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your fifty men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. At this the king sent to Elijah another captain and fifty men. The captain said to him, Man of God, this is what the king says, come down at once. Elijah said, If I am a man of God, Elijah replied, May fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then the fire of God fell from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. So uh, the king is sending these 50 men uh, to go get Elijah, right? A captain and 50 men. And the king wants to harm Elijah. So what's Elijah doing? He's calling fire down from heaven on these people that want to harm him. Uh, Elijah, if you don't know, was a great prophet in the Old Testament. His story can be found uh, in 1 Kings and 2 Kings, and he shows up uh, in 1 Kings 17, where he announces a drought for three and a half years. <laughs> Wait, a drought for three and a half years? We'll get to that in a second. So here we see this great prophet, again a prophet, from the Old Testament, Elijah, calling down fire from heaven to destroy people that want to destroy him. We also see Elijah do this again in 1 Kings. So in 1 Kings, this is 18, uh, 25, what happens is there's an evil king named 
Ahab and his wife Jezebel, and they are just evil people, and they're worshiping this false god Baal. And they have prophets worshiping the uh, false god. So Elijah, this mighty prophet from the Old Testament, says, your god's false, and I'll prove it. Let's Let me challenge you. Let's sacrifice a bull, and your 450 prophets go out. If they can call fire down from heaven, your god is real. If they can't, and I can, just me, and my one god, the god of Israel, can call, it, call down fire from heaven, then you have to admit he's real. And this is where the taunt was invented. Are you a sports fan? <laughs> you, you know, taunting, it's a flag in the NFL when you're taunting somebody. Elijah starts taunting these prophets, right? This is great. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he is deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears and their customs until the blood flowed. Midday passed and nothing happened. Then Elijah wants to show off a bit. Right? Not only is he taunting, now he's, he's uh, overly celebrating. So he tells them to drench his bowl with a bunch of water. And then he calls down fire from God. Comes, calls down fire from heaven once again. And then he winds up killing the 450 prophets with his own sword. So Elijah, once again, the point is how that Elijah, we see him calling fire down from heaven once again. I'm going to jump to the conclusion that this is enough to say, okay, Elijah is one of the prophets, one of the two witnesses, but there's more. Just wait, like an infomercial, just wait, there's more. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying, and they have the power to turn waters into bloods. Okay, who shuts up the heavens so it doesn't rain? That's back to Elijah as well. 1 King 17, what is Elijah doing the first time we are introduced to him in the Bible? Now Elijah, the Tishabite from Tishabib in Galad, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. What? So Elijah not only has the power to call down fire from heaven, we see him doing it twice on people that want to harm him, he also has the power to shut up the heavens and keep it from raining. And he's also a prophet. So check, check, check. So far, all the boxes are being checked for Elijah as being one of the two witnesses. Second part. They have power to turn the waters into blood and strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Who does that sound like? Who turns water into blood? Who brought the plagues? God. But who did God use to announce these plagues that he was striking down on Egypt? When Egypt wouldn't let the wouldn't let Israel go, when he wouldn't let the Jewish people go. Who did God use? In Exodus 7, we're seeing God use Moses to turn water to the blood. So what does one of these prophets do? They have the power to turn water to blood. Here God is using Moses to turn water to blood. Moses is another prime suspect. What follows Moses turning this water to blood? Plagues, the plague of frogs, the plague of gnats, the plague of flies, the plague of livestock, the plague of hell, the plague of bulls, the plague of locusts, the plague of darkness, and the plague of the firstborn. Back to Revelation 11. They have the power to shut the heavens so that it will not rain during the time they are prophesying. They have the power to turn waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. Sure sounds like Elijah and Moses to me. But if you're still not convinced, there's still a little bit more I want to present to you. So, everything I, I see so far, we know there are prophets, right? Elijah and Moses were both prophets. We know these guys, these two witnesses in Revelation 11, are going to have power to call down fire from heaven. We see Elijah do that a couple of times. We know they're going to have the power to sew up the heavens so it doesn't rain. We see Elijah do that. We know they're going to have the power to turn water into blood. We see Moses do that. And we know they're going to have the, the power to strike the earth with as many plagues as they want. And we see Moses witnessing all of God unleashing the plagues on Egypt. But now let's talk about Jesus. Let's see what Jesus, if Jesus has anything to say about these two prophets. And for that, 
We're going to flip to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in His Father's glory with His angels, and then He will reward each person according to what they have done. That's mentioned later in Revelations. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming into His kingdom. Now, we know all the disciples died, right? So, Jesus is talking about when He comes back after the resurrection, the second coming. Um, that's what He's talking about there. But we know all the disciples are dead, so He couldn't be talking that they would live, you know, 2,000 and something years because they all died, you know, back here. They all lived normal lifespans. So, what is he talking about? Let's read down to Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up to high on the mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah. Talking with Jesus. Peter said, Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. As Peter often did, Peter's missing the point of what he's seeing here, right? Peter is so excited about what he's seeing. He is trying to take action and do something quick and uh, just be Peter. But uh, I love how this says, while he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered from them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, who I love, with who I am well pleased. Listen to him. So, shh, Peter, shh. God's telling Peter to shh. Listen to Jesus and take a look. Take in what you're seeing because it's really important. But the transfiguration, what is that? Jesus is lighting up. He's becoming white. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And just there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. So this is a coming attraction. This is a preview. This is Jesus showing Peter, James, and John what it's going to look like when he comes back. And who is there with Jesus? Two great prophets, Moses and Elijah. Why would Moses and Elijah be with Jesus here at this point? Why would Jesus be showing the disciples what's going to happen, what the second coming is going to look like? Well, who's one of the disciples with him? John. Who wrote Revelations? John. I think this was to show John what the second coming was going to look like. This was a preview of what the second coming is going to look like. So because we see Moses and Elijah appearing here with Jesus, and all the other evidence I pointed out, I truly believe Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses mentioned in Revelations 11. And I just caught this this week. So Matthew 17, 11. Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him but have done to them everything they wished in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood he was talking to them about John the Baptist. So I've never understood this, right? I've never understood this. And then this week, I heard a guy talk on this, and it went off. It went off like a light above my head. It went off, and I was like, oh, that's what that means. So Matthew 17, 11 it should be separated, right? You know, the Bible wasn't really writ originally written with chapters and verses. It was just long. So let's take this in two parts. Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah comes. To be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. Future tense. Elijah will come and restore all things. Separated. Something different. Different topic. But I tell you, Elijah has already came, and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished, in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. So that Elijah that already came, the disciples know he was talking about John the Baptist, who was a prophet in the spirit of Elijah. But to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things, 
I think that is a reference to Elijah coming in Revelation 11. Elijah comes and will, comes and will restore all things. That's the key word there. Elijah is still to come. So when Elijah, John the Baptist, has came and they didn't recognize him and they killed him like they're going to kill Jesus, but Elijah will come and restore all things in Revelation 11. I believe that is, that's exactly what that's saying there. And the one other thing we can point out is let's go to Malachi, which is the last book. This is one of the last things God said to us before he went silent for 400 years. When the last things God said through a prophet in Israel for 400 years was this verse we can find in Malachi 4. And Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. Malachi 4.4, 4. remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and the laws I gave him at Horeb and for Israel. Malachi 4.4, 4. remember the law of my servant Moses and the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all of Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. Right there. I will send Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So Elijah's coming before Jesus, right? So that, again, I think is a reference to the two witnesses. He will turn the hearts and parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come strike the land with total destruction. What happens in Revelations? We see the land <laughs> struck with total destruction. So there you go. That's who I think the uh, two witnesses in Revelations 11 are. I think that's the scripture that supports who the witnesses in Revelations in 11 are. And I think it's fascinating to talk about who these guys could be. Um, I really do. So I think with everything we looked at, we saw they had to be prophets. They were Moses and Elijah. They could call fire down from heaven, Elijah. They can sail off the heavens and make it not rain, Elijah. They can turn water into blood and strike the earth with plagues, Moses. And we see him in the transfiguration, Moses and Elijah. We see him at the end of Malachi, Moses and Elijah. One other very interesting thing I forgot to hit on is this is a really weird <laughs> A weird verse, and we don't get a lot on this, but in Jude, which is the last book before Revelations, what happened to Moses' body after he died? Well, apparently, there was a skirmish between the devil and the uh, Archangel Michael about Moses' body, but this is all we really get on this. Jude 1.8. In the very same way, on the strength of their dreams, these ungodly people pollute their own bodies, reject, uh, reject authority, and heap abuse on celestial beings. But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare condemn him for slander, but said, to the, the Lord rebuke you. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why the devil... And Archangel Michael were fighting over Moses' body, but they were. Jude tells us they were. So, that just leads me, and it, it's always dangerous to jump to conclusions in Scripture. But it kind of leads me to believe that God has something important in store for Moses. Still, that leads me to believe that God still has something important in store for Moses. Like Moses' ministry here wasn't finished, right? God still has something to do. So the Archangel Michael was protecting his body from Satan. I don't know why. I don't know why. It's just odd that that's there, right? It's odd that that's there. I don't understand it. If you do, drop it in the comments. Let me know what you think about that verse. But I think all the evidence we see in Scripture, everything I pointed out to you, really leads to these two witnesses, be it Moses and Elijah. And I love Revelations. Revelations is fun to talk about. These theories are fun to talk about. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter who the two witnesses are, right? It's fun to speculate. It's fun to talk about. It's fun to kind of, for me, it's fun to try to solve the mystery and put all the clues together. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. What matters is 
your relationship with Jesus Christ and if you have accepted Jesus Christ. That's what's going to get you into heaven. Not, hey, can you figure out who these two witnesses are? Can you put all these clues together? No, that's just fine. But your ticket to heaven and your only ticket to heaven is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ and you don't know where you're going, if you were to die in a car wreck today and you didn't know where you were going, you need to fix that. We're here for a short time, but we have eternal life. We have a gift of pardon. And no matter what sin you committed outside of one, the one unforgivable sin, God will forgive you. It's there. He died on the cross for your sins. You have to repent, which means change your mind, turn away from sin, talk to him, and say, I accept you. I accept your gift, Lord. I need you in my life. My life is better with you than without you, Lord. I want to be with you forever, God. I want to serve you. I am here for you, God. Show me the way, Lord. Talk to God. Start your relationship with God. That's the way to get into heaven. That is the only way to get into heaven. So if you don't know Jesus, if you don't know God, please start today. Just a simple prayer. Lord, I need you. Lord, show me how to accept you. Lord, show me how to follow your words. Lord, help me repent and turn against sin. Lord, thank you for new life. Thank you for my life. It is now yours. In your holy name I pray. Amen. I'm Larry Stanley, and this is a Sunday morning message. Thank you for watching on YouTube. Um, you know, I actually re tried to record this message two weeks ago, but I was having issues. I had a lot of technical problems, and for some reason, I couldn't get this message recorded that day. I recorded it three times, and it didn't take once. There was an issue every single time. So um, that was part of the reason for the delay. I've been traveling a lot for work. That was another reason. But thank you guys, everybody asking about these messages. Here's the next one. I will definitely see you next week with another Sunday morning message. Moving forward, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do two videos a week. It is just not possible. But I am going to focus on these Sunday morning messages. The Bible study videos I have done are up. And if I do have time to do two videos a week, I will for Bible study. But I'm mainly going to focus on these Sunday morning message videos just because I can cover so much more. Um, and I do encourage you to get Bible study video, get your Bible study on. Uh, there are a lot of great Bible study videos on YouTube. So find one, get your Bible study on, and join me next Sunday for another Sunday morning message.